You might be curious about what does I.O. mean because it's not a really typical term you see. And what does I.O. mean under the context of the modern data lakes, right? So you have heard a lot of talks in the both like keynotes and then panels and also lighting talks discussing the modern data stack. But I'm just give, gonna give you another view on that. And then first thing first, why should you care about I.O.? So I.O. really means it's something that is related. I.O. It means input output, right? It means input output operations. And when data is read or from written from your storage, by the computation. And then why, why do you, should you care? Why does it matter to you, right? You just raise your hands, right? And then let's take the time machine back to the Hadoop era. And it's more than 10 years ago. I have a decade of work experiences. When I just started working, it was all like Hadoop, talking about big data, Hadoop. And it's all like from the computation side, it's the Hadoop and storage is HDFS. And maybe MapReduce is a little bit old from that time. And we have the on-prem data warehouse. And, and also, we may call it EDW or something like that. And we're usually just use a single region data center or single region like private cloud, if we call that. And then things have changed. And nowadays, we have a compute storage separation. And now, Brina, you were talking about disaggregation of compute and storage. You have a lot of like the things because you, you have enjoyed the benefits of scale them independently. You don't have to pay a lot of things to scale them together. And then you have the cloud-based data lakes, like you use your S3, your Azure Blob, your GCS as your source of truth of data for your data lake. And then you may have a multi-region data lake, which means that your data is might be across regions. So I've seen this more and more common for uh, large enterprises or smaller companies because of a lot of the reasons, technical or non-technical, or they're in the middle of cloud migration. They have hybrid cloud or multi-cloud type of architecture to leverage like the negotiation power for the cloud vendors. And all of these are behind the ideas of making your data infra or data platform more scalable, cheaper, easier to manage, and also more elastic as you want to expand your usage of that kind of uh, data platform. And then, however, it brings a lot of challenges to I.O. as I talk about something that data has to be traveled from your uh, storage side to your compute side through the network. Because think about it, you're having your like Amazon S3 and you have EC2, although it might be in the same region, but still travel from the network, right? This is something that's related to I.O. And also think about the concept of data, data locality. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but that used to be a design principle when you're in the Hadoop. It's decoupled, it's, sorry, it's coupled compute and storage. You don't want data to travel from the network. You want them to be together, but now locality is no longer something that is in the design concepts or the principle anymore. So that brings the uh, challenges I'm going to talk about today. I'm just going to address why this is really important to you guys. Uh, first, it's about latency or performance. So think about if you're running like Trino Presto or Spark SQL kind of workloads and your data is remote, so it's somewhat occur some latency depending on like what kind of how like how fast you need the data to be delivered to your um, computation, especially for those ad hoc queries. So you might come across high latency for that. And then for your model training, um, if you are doing your own model training on your own infra, like if you, especially there is a problem that is called many small file problem, if you are familiar with that, because metadata operations or listing many small files will be very slow on a very typical commodity object storage. So you might be, have to choose some kind of high performance storage in terms of dealing with the many small file problem. And also think about cost, because if you have purchased any like the hardware or you have your own data center, the cost is something that is uh, overhead already. And then if you're using the cloud, you're renting the resources from the cloud vendors. They're charging you by usage. They're charging you by how many times you have the operation, like the get, 
put operations on S3 is very typical. Like it, you, it might be a small number. Think about it's a few cents every thousand requests, but they accumulate very fast as you scale, uh, depending on how intensive your job is. And also there is a, something called data transfer fee or egress cost, if you're aware of. So they are like much more higher than the get put kind of operation. So they, it's just cheap to put it in the cloud and then harder to get it out when it's cross region or when it, you want to like have your data in another cloud. And then finally think about GPUs because I was at GTC last week and then they have a new very powerful Blackwell super chip. It's super fast. So if your data is like how you deliver, how fast you deliver your data cannot match the speed of computation of GPUs, it's really like waste of GPU resources. Think about you are running EC2 of GPU clusters. You don't want them to be wasted. I see it typically, it only runs about 30% to 50% of utilization in a typical scenario from the users I work with. And also finally about reliability, if you have come across the 503 kind of job failure type of uh, failure um, code. That means like you don't want your system like to be have your reliability issues that slow down or job failures or service unavailable kind of thing just because it exceeds the number of requests to your like Amazon S3 as an example. And then now you can you know like why this matters to you, right? Um, I'm just going to give one solution here. That is only one of the huge solutions or a huge optimization you might think of. So it's based on the fact or a number that I, so I work at Aluxio, which is an open source company. So we work with a lot of like large internet company, including Uber, Meta, TikTok, and Expedia. So these companies, uh, we have insights into their IO patterns, like how many like read and writes and number of files, number of like operations and also the file types and size of the files. We have insights into all of these. And this number is only 10% of your data is hot, which means not all of your data is frequently accessed. We really call this hot data or working set. So, so think about the hot data kind of concept in your, so you're studying computer science, you must be very familiar with the uh, concept of having a cache, right? So can we just add a cache layer between compute and storage, like to bring data closer to compute? I know there are a lot of ways, like bring data close, bring data to compute, or bring data to, uh, bring compute to your data. So a lot of ways of doing that here, I'm just going to talk about the way of bringing data close to compute because you are not bringing your entire data set. You are bringing, only bringing the working set of your data set and usually it's less than 10%. And I'm just going to show you like a simple, simple scenario of how does this work. So first, from the latency perspective, think about your jobs consist of computation and IO and followed by another computation and IO. I know it can be paralleled, but think about this in the simple way that it happens like this. So by having a cache to co-locate the data with your compute, you can greatly reduce the time of your IO time, which means you are reducing the entire total job run time just because you have this like guaranteed latency as if your data is local. And then it's also related to your GPU because think about, I mentioned the number of 30% to 50% of GPU utilization because for Ray and for PyTorch kind of workload, uh, kind of engines, they have, you really have a data loader part. Like, because like Torch, uh, PyTorch has a data, a data loader and then Ray has Ray data. So their, their behaviors be like they load data in the beginning of each epoch, which means you have to, like the GPU, expensive GPUs has, has to wait for data when they are retrieving that in the beginning of each epoch. So with cache, like the IO portion is greatly shortened or even eliminated, you can see like GPU is almost all busy over there. So which means the GPU utilization is greatly in, increased. So the number we usually see would be from 30% or 50% to uh, almost 90%, which is very huge. 
And from the cost perspective, like I have seen so many architecture diagram on my feed that they have like moving arrows, like animated arrows. I wish I, I could move them. But I have this visualization here, like a Trino and cross region S3 as an example. So if you are just directly accessing these S3, uh, depending on how intensive your Trino application is, it's retrieving data directly from S3 and incurring a lot of the get costs and then cross-region data transfer costs. And then if you use the cache, then the interactions between the, the, like the S3 and Trino is greatly reduced because it's only retrieving the data when necessary and is, you will have less requests directly from your S3 to your Trino. So that is easy to understand, right? And then finally, think about like cache something like a buffer or a shield to remove the job failure, like a job failure challenges, because um, it's still like less request through your network and less request uh, directly to your under storage. So it's really like helping with the job failure problem. So finally, I know I have a few minutes left. Finally, I'm going to give you two real world examples to uh, help you. And these are all running in production and also like very large scale production. Uh, one, the first one is Uber. So Uber is a Presto user and is using the Presto Alexio local cache and they have a really large fleet Presto. They have 1,500 nodes of Presto and then petabytes of data stored in their HDFS. I know like they haven't started their data migration to the cloud yet, but it's really related to their decision of, of uh, going to the cloud. That is why. So you can see from the diagram here and uh, on, the, on the top, the diagram is seeing like be, without cache and with cache, the difference of the request to GCS. So they, they have do an initial test on GCS. So it's over 80% of the read request to GCS is saved, which means they are going to save a lot of money when they are uh, use the same stack on the cloud. But if they are doing no optimization on the cloud, and if they just move it and then to something on par on the cloud, it, they will they have to come across a lot of like a large bill. And then from the like bottom diagram is showing the latency reduction. So it's, a, it's really something that I was talking about, um, like the cost saving perspective, latency perspective, that these are all like running, uh, this is initial testing and also it's running, um, like having some latency improvement already in production on their HDFS. So the last one I'm going to share looks a little bit complicated. This one is a, a Q&A platform in Asia. It's really popular one. It's like a feed on your uh, app, like phone app. It's like user generated content. Uh, you have a question and they have a lot of user generated content. And this ML data pipeline is related to their business. It's super important because they're running this for their ML LLM uh, model and their recommendation engine. So they have run this like multi-region, cross-region like uh, training. And also they have their trained model to be persist into their source of truth. They are using HDFS. And then finally, they'll do the model serving or model deployment in their um, for their downstream applications because their model needs to be up updated hourly. So this come, uh, they have come across a lot of the challenges I just talked about today. For example, many small file problem and low GPU utilization problem during training. And also when thousands of applications are retrieving the latest model, because think about LLMs are big. So when they're retrieving the big models, when they're doing model updates, you really have some pressures on their HDFS job failures and also pressures on their network. So by having a cache in the middle, like I'm here, just, Aloxo is an example it's here. So it can firstly like two to four times faster training. And then from their previously only run like 50% of uh, GPU utilization and now it's 90% and they have a more reliable, reliable platform than before. So which is great. They are running all of these in production and Aloxo is open source. So you guys, if you are, if you are interested, you can try it out. 
a few takeaways from today's session. I know like it's been long, but um, just first of all, like we, we talk about modern data stack, you heard a lot about modern data stack. So think about from the data locality, pers locality perspective of modern data stack, and also think about like how these would affect your uh, performance cost and reliability of your platform if you are working on that. And also finally, to maybe you can consider that if you have come across some of the challenges I just mentioned. And so finally, uh, to have, if, no matter you're running Presto, Trino, or Spark SQL kind of workloads, or you're running PyTorch, Array kind of workload, you can all like think about this because they have, they all have these kind of optimizations that you can use. So I think I'm right on time. I have my contact information here, and email, uh, LinkedIn, Slack, uh, also QR code, uh, and also I have some Q swag. This is Baymax. You can grab some from me if you like. Thank you.